Hi, welcome to the Bioinformatics chat. Today I'm speaking with Mikhail Kalmagorov. Mikhail is a PhD student at uh, the University of California, San Diego, at Pavel Pevsner's lab. And uh, we will be talking about genome assembly and the assembler that Mikhail works on, which is called Fly. Mikhail, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Roman. Uh, Mikhail, tell us a bit about yourself and your background. So I'm originally from Ekaterinburg, um, and I moved to St. Petersburg for um, for college. I did my bachelor's in applied math, and then I found about this exciting program in bioinformatics in St. Petersburg University of the Russian Academy of Sciences. It is a uh, very small school um, near St. Petersburg Polytechnic University. There's maybe a uh, hundred hundred PhD students and. I think now they have master's students as well. And they had this small program in bioinformatics. So I enrolled and initially I wanted to simply work on fun computer science problems and write algorithms, implement them. I, I wanted to become a, a good coder, programmer. And then I realized that I actually like research. I, I like bioinformatics and I I like uh, writing papers. I like uh, basically doing some some new stuff. Um, and I graduated from from this master program in Saint Petersburg, and then I went to UC San Diego for to start a PhD program um, five years ago, I believe. And now I'm here. It's been five years. I'm almost done with uh, my PhD degree. Hopefully, and I'm I'm excited to tell you more about about stuff that I'm working on. So you're working on the assembler called Fly. Is that the project that you started in the lab, or was it already going when you arrived? Um, it's that's a good question. So this is not the first project I've been working on. So I I was working on Fly for maybe two years. Maybe a little more, and like there were some other projects uh, on 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 different topics that I've been working like since I started my program uh, regarding fly. Uh, this was there were some efforts going on in the lab. Um, it was it was a previous um, some previous students and postdocs in in Pavel's lab. Um, uh, Yulin, um, who used to be a postdoc and he's now a professor in, in Australian National University and, uh, a, another PhD student, Jeffrey Yuan, uh, he recently graduated and he, uh, he's now at Illumina in, here in San Diego. It's, it's a, it's a big, uh, biotech sequencing company. Uh, so they've been working on a precursor to fly called Abru. Um, and this is where they were developing the methods to, to, for finding overlaps between, uh, long and noisy reads. Um, and the idea was based on, on this frequent solid cameras. And this is, it's kind of, it became later, it became a, the part of fly. So I joined the project on this stage. So. Um, since these guys were working on April, and there was another sort of independent, uh, independent project, independent efforts on, uh, consensus calling and polishing. Because, um, in, in long reads, we typically, uh, separate the structural assembly. And then, uh, once you have the structure, you, you also need to get your nucleotide based quality to, um, you need to get it right. And this is almost like a separate problem. And so these guys were working on this as well. While, when so that's what you call polishing. This is, yes, this is polishing. And, uh, there is an interesting story behind the name fly. Do you want to tell it? Um, so the story goes that, um, fly was a French mathematician, I believe. And, well, Fly is um, his last name, I think. He's been working on the brewing graphs as well. And he was actually the first to prove 
um, some facts about De Bruyne graph sequences, what we now call De Bruyne graph sequences, but at this time it was just some, some like binary sequences. Um, and he was the first one to prove, I think, the fact about the existence of De Bruyne sequence. So De Bruyne sequence is basically a, a bi- original, it used to be defined on over the binary alphabet. So it's a binary sequence. Uh, such that it encodes, um, it encodes all possible substrings of, of length k. So now we denote this as k-mers. And uh, you want to find a minimal sequence, sequence like this. And like at this time, people didn't know if the sequences even exist. And I believe, uh, this mathematician fly and I'm pretty sure my, my French pronunciation is not correct. I apologize for this. But he was the first one to prove the existence of, of these sequences for binary alphabets. And, and De Bruyne was working on, on, on these sequences as well. And he, I mean, they got his name. But he, De Bruyne himself acknowledged that Fly was, was, uh, his work was one of the first work on, on this kind of sequences and graphs. So this is why we picked this name. Very cool. And uh, I should probably explain the, the connection. So the mm-hmm. De Bruyne graphs that are used for assembly, they were also used to prove the existence of this De Bruyne sequence. That's correct, yes. Yeah. De, De Bruyne sequence does not simply share the name with De Bruyne graphs. They're actually connected. Oh, and of course. La- later, De Bruyne graphs were uh, utilized for, for genome assembly. Mm-hmm. And so, as we know, De Bruyne graphs are one way to do genome assembly. Right. But there are all sorts of different graphs used for assembly. And uh, today we will talk about your own flavor of, mm-hmm. of these assembly graphs. But can you make a general overview, a brief general overview of like the various graphs that are used for assembly. Um, right. So I think historically one of the first and very uh, sort of natural approaches that was proposed was overlap graphs. So I sort of need to, to do an introduction of, of, of genome assembly problem in, in, in general, right? So, it, but it's very simple. So you have your, the goal is to, to read the sequence of a genome, and it could be a small genome, and people historically started to work with small viruses and, and phage, uh, and then they started to analyze more, more like complex genomes such as bacteria, and then they moved to eukaryotes, to drosophila, and then finally to humans. And the technology does not allow you to sequence the entire chromosome sequence or genome sequence. Instead, you can only sample short substrings of this sequence called reads, but you can sample as, as many reads as you want in gen- generally. And so what your results into would be a huge set of these short overlapping sequences, reads. And then your computational problem is given these short sequences, you need to assemble them back into the original, uh, chromosome original string. And a very natural idea is that, okay, if you have a two, if you have two reads that overlap, right, that share sufficient overlap, overlapping sequence, they probably come from a related region of the genome. And this way you can uh, take all your, all your, your reads and, um, you find them as nodes on, on your graph and you will connect the overlapping reads with an edge. And this structure, uh, this, this graph is what people call overlap graph. And basically it encodes your, um, there exists a path in this graph that encodes your, uh, genomic sequence because you can traverse from one read to another read and so on. And this way you can traverse your original chromosome. And now the problem is how, how would you find this path corresponding to your original sequence? Um, uh, and th- these are like 
different sorts of algorithms to, for doing this, and it depends on the genome, on the genome size, and the genome complexity. And there are like many, many uh, different flavors, and it applies to also to different sequencing technologies. So, we, mm, yeah, but the original idea is you put a node for each read, and you connect two nodes with an edge if if these two reads share sufficient overlap. So this is overlap graph. And this approach was very popular for... Um, so it's historically, I think, uh, used to be the first approach that was proposed. I think in early 90s, maybe even, even before. And it was also popularized by uh, Gene Myers, who used to be a researcher at Cellular Genomics. And um, this approach was uh, first applied for Sanger sequencing reads uh, that were roughly hundred, uh, roughly a thousand base pairs in length. And for comparison, uh, a simple bacterial genome is is several million, several million base pairs. In. So uresis are like basically. Uh, 100,000 times shorter than your genome. And mm, so they basically was, were working on whole genome assembler, uh, and this was resulted into something called Celera assembler. And they used this assembler to assemble Drosophila genome first, and then they actually um, used it to assemble human genome, at least parts of, of the human genome in uh, during the human uh, genome sequencing project. And there was an alternative approach that was proposed a bit later, uh, I think in, in the middle of 1990s, and uh, it, it kind of began to, so people began to implement it in, in early 2000s, I believe, and this is called De Bruyne Graph. And this is like, uh, this was based on these De Bruyne Graphs that we were just talking about. Um, and originally, I think proposed by, uh, me, uh, Mike Waterman's group. And my current, uh, advisor, Paul Pesner, he used to be, uh, his postdoc. So he, he used to work on, on these different graphs. And, uh, I believe he's one of the people who actually, like, popularized this approach. And this resulted into, into many, uh, many practical assemblers later on. And, mm, this approach was originally proposed for Sanger read, the Bruin graphs approach, but it turns out that um, it was actually much more useful for the next generation of sequencing technologies, uh, such as Illumina sequencing. And this this is this is how we we, we denote this <laughs> this set of technologies, next generation sequencing technologies, right? Um, and the difference is with Illumina sequencing, you get much shorter reads. Instead of thousand space pairs, you can get a hundred base pairs and even shorter. It was even shorter at this, at like this time, maybe 50 base pairs. On the other hand, you can produce these reads in parallel very quickly. And this is, this is, was, uh, by the orders of magnitude cheaper than uh, Sanger read sequencing. And this is why a lot of, well, mo most of the people switched from Sanger sequencing to, to short read sequencing, uh, really fast. And it turned out that the Bruin graphs were actually very useful in, in case of short read sequencing because, uh, with short reads, you get shorter, yeah, you get shorter fragments, but the number of fragments is Significantly higher, uh, you, you get significantly more fragments than you would get the center reads. And as a result, in overlap graph, you need to compute, uh, pairs alignments between all read pairs. And it became very expensive for, uh, massive short parallel sequencing because the number of, of fragments is so much higher. And on the other hand, the Bruin graphs, in the Bruin graphs, you, you don't need to do pairwise comparisons between reads. Instead, you're using this uh, K-MERS to build the graph. And this this was one of the reasons why uh, the Bruin graphs became so popular, I believe. 
And uh, short tree sequencing, I think it was most of the popular genome assemblers on short, based on short tree sequencing were, were based on De Bruyne graphs. So De Bruyne graphs are more efficient uh, than, than overlap graphs for assembly because you can quickly build them. But uh, do we lose anything when transitioning to De Bruyne graphs? Are there any downsides? Um, so you use some connectivity information because to build the Bruin graphs, you split your reads into shorter fragments called k-mers. And typically, if you have short reads of length maybe hundreds, then uh, you will be working with k-mers of size maybe 50. And you will you will be basically building the graph from this like shorter substrings. Um, and this is why you sort of lose some long range information from reads, but this this is all this only happens during the uh, stage when you build the graph. So once you build the brain graph, you will then reuse the information from reads by uh, so what assemblers typically do they uh, build the graph and they they map your original reads back on this graph and then they try to simplify this graph. Um, based on this, uh, this path that's like based on the street path that treats and use on the graph. So yes, you're sort of losing the connectivity information during the graph construction, but then you, you still have access to reads information and you can, then you can trace how, how reads traverse the graph and then you can simplify this graph. So in the end, you both overlap and De Bruyne graph uh, algorithms should, in the end, they should theoretically produce the optimal assembly given this uh, set of reads. Okay, so so we've covered the Sanger sequencing, we've covered next generation sequencing, but next came uh, long read sequencing, and how how did that impact the art and science of assemblers? Well, um, it impacted. Uh, well, the impact was huge. And basically, it turns out that people needed completely new algorithms to to assemble long reads, and this is because of two things. So, long reads are basically much much longer than Illumina reads. So, for comparison, Illumina Illum, in, with the mo, with the current Illumina machines, you might get, I think, the maximum would be two hundred and fifty nucleotides reads of this length. And, and you might get pairs of these reads, right? So you might get pairs of, uh, reads of 250 and separated by maybe, uh, 500 nucleotides. And then with long reads, you can get, uh, routinely get tens of thousands, uh, nucleotides, long reads. And the current people are also interested in, in increasing this length. And currently with, um, there exists some protocols called ultra long reads, and with these protocols and with uh, PugBy and uh, Oxford Nanopore sequencing uh, sequencers, you might even get reads over hundred thousand. And I think some some labs were managed to get even even millions of uh, nucleotides long reads, and this is this is super exciting. On the other hand, the problem with these technologies is that error rate is so much higher. So for Illuminary, it's used to be very, very accurate. So um, the error rate was less than 0.1%. So for for a read of length 100, there's like a high chance that there are no errors in these reads uh, at all. And the, the error modes were also very um, sort of... Mm, Convenient because, uh, Illumina errors were just space substitutions. For long reads, for PugBy and for Oxford nanopores, the error rate is roughly 15%, 10 to 15%. So compared to 0.1%. Um, and then the, the errors are mostly insertions and deletions and they are much harder to handle in the algorithms. So, 
uh, bottle lime, you get much longer reads, but the error rate is also much higher. So, and you need, you need new algorithms to handle this uh, data. And uh, there already exist some algorithms that can cope with the specifics of long reads, right? Mm-hmm. What are the issues with those assemblers that you try to to correct in fly uh okay so so historically um initially people were trying to to do this as follows basically they said okay we had this very noisy reads let's try to error correct them first and then reuse the existing assemblers because um because the existing assemblers such as um Celera assembler for, for Sanger reads that, that is based on overlap graphs was basically designed to, to similar purposes for like, uh, Sanger reads were, were longer than the luminaries, um, um, a thousand base pairs long. And this was somewhat similar to what early long read studies were getting. And the idea was, okay, let's error correct these reads somehow. And then simply feed it to existing assemblers. Um, and that's what, uh, people did. And they initially were trying to error correct, uh, PacBio. So PacBio was historically the first long read sequencing technologies. And, um, they used to error correct PacBio reads with Illumina. Um, and this is because, of course, was like challenging by itself. So you need to map these short reads to your long and noisy reads. And then you basically substitute the, uh, the parts of, uh, the mapped parts of long reads with your, uh, short Illumina sequencing. And then you, you, uh, continue to do this with like next, uh, Illumina reads and so on. And in the end, you theoretically will get like a accurate and long reads. And then you can, and then they were using Solar Assembler to, to get your, uh, final context and, and chromosomes. Um, and then, um, like the next studies, they were trying to error correct bug bio reads without any extra information. So this, this is something that was called self error correction. And the idea is similar. So you somehow align, uh, you do pairwise alignments of all bug bio reads and you take one single read and you, you have all the, other reads that aligns to this one. And then you try to sort of compute a consensus of, of multiple reads. And this will result into like, uh, sort of more, uh, confident sequence. And then you can, uh, you can feed the error corrected sequences to, to the, uh, Solera. And so this is something that, uh, people are still, I think this is a still a dominating approach. Error correct first and then assemble. And, um, the first, first assembler was, uh, called PBCR, I believe. And um, then there were two more popular assemblers that are still being used and like they're still the most state of the art. Uh, first one is called Falcon and it was developed in, in PacBio at this time, at that time. And the other one is called Canoe. And Canoe is, is interesting because it's, it is sort of a, a fork of Celera Assembler. So it's, it's, it borrowed a lot of code and a lot of ideas from the original Celera Assemblers. And even the original software engineers who worked on Celera Assemblers now, now working on Canoe. And I think this is very exciting. So if you think about this, Celera Assembler was developed uh 20 years ago and it's still being used and it's still being sort of so i think this this tells us something about the the, i mean the quality of the work that people did in the past anyway um so the uh the problem here is that this error correction step is very uh time consuming because you still need to compute all versus all pairwise alignments and the errors make this problem very difficult. So the more, the higher error rate you need to tolerate, more, the more difficult your, uh, align procedures will be. The more like, it kind of like expands your search space. And I mean, many groups were working on improving the speed of, of error correction step. But, um, 
something that we wanted to initially implement in Fly and in its precursor A Bruin was what if we do not do error correction? What if we just try to assemble the uh the row PugBio and Oxford Nanopore reads? And then uh assem- and we can assemble maybe we can assemble the structure of the genome and then we can error correct. And this way we can uh skip this error correction step and this this will result into like a significant speed speed up. And so Abrun was one of the first as uh, assemblers that sort of implemented this paradigm. There was another one called Mini Asm. Um and I think they were released mm, Mini Asm was released a little earlier. And Mini Asm was actually it, it became a very popular assembler as well. Uh it, it is created by Han Lee, who is also he's he's one of the I think one of the most famous uh sort of uh hackers in bioinformatics. So he he's the one who created the popular alignment tool BWA. Um he has some other work like uh population size estimation uh and and a couple of years ago, he started working on genome assembly and he created this, uh, mapping tool called Minimap and then used it to, uh, in, in assembly of, of long reads in, and this resulted into a tool called Mini, uh, Mini ISM. So those were the first two, I believe, first two assemblers, Mini ISM and Abrun, that did not require error correction and they were faster than, uh, these, what we call here hierarchical approaches, uh, such as uh, and the assemblers such as Falcon and Canoe. So, give us some numbers, some timings uh, to to grasp the the magnitude of what we're talking about here. So, if you were to assemble, I don't know what what do you usually assemble? Do you assemble a human genome? Do you assemble some kind of E. coli or a virus? We try to assemble different genomes. We try to make sure that. Uh, Fly works well on, on wide range of, of genomes. So currently you can, so fly, fly is faster than, uh, the early hierarchical approaches, but, yeah, also I, I must know that like other, uh, assemblers are getting faster as well. So they're like getting optimized and even hierarchical approaches, they, uh, they became faster. So I think for, for early studies for this PBCR tool, uh, they were assembling Drosophila, and Drosophila is one of the, the most important model organisms. And they basically reported that they needed a few CPU years to, to assemble it initially. Um, and they obviously had, uh, had a good, I think very powerful, powerful computing cluster to, to perform this assembly. And this was basically because Drosophila genome has a lot of repeats. And the more repeats you have, the, the more difficult your, your alignment will, uh, your alignment becomes. And of course, it is optimized now. So out of two, out of those two CPU years, how much would you estimate would go towards read correction? Well, most of it is read correction. Oh, really? Yes. At least, at least it used to be. So like with Canoe and Falcon, currently you can assemble Drosophila uh, maybe within a thousand CPU hours. So it's, it's like magnitudes faster now, but, um, it is still not as fast as fly. So fly can assemble a Drosophila in, uh, I think we have this number in the paper. And, uh, so like wall clock time, it takes maybe, uh, it, it runs overnight. So this must be maybe a hundred or like a few hundred CPU hours. So we typically five to ten times faster than than Kano. That's very impressive. So let's talk about the the secret sauce that uh, Fly uses. So the core idea, as I understand it, or or the core insight to spitting it up, is realizing that you don't need to error correct the reads but obviously you do right be there there is a good reason why people used to mm-hmm. error correct so what do you replace that with how do you have a good assembly without error correction what was the insight that allowed you to skip error correction um so this was originally 
developed in, in the Abrium assembler. And the insight was that it was basically the A pruning graph. And this was originally proposed by, uh, Paul Pesner, I believe, in, in like early 2000s. So what, what is an Abrune graph? So Abrune graph is, you can think about it as a generalization of, of Debrune graphs. So in Debrune graph, you sort of, you can think about a construction process of the graph. So, um, what you do, you take your reads, you split them into sequences of k-mers, and then you glue the k-mers if they spell the same sequence. So Abrian graph says, okay, we have an abstract set of reads and like abstract sequences, and then you can glue them based on whatever criteria you want. And you, you can use um, local alignments to glue to glue sequence instead of k-mers and this way you can actually tolerate some noise in in your reads uh, but yes you can think about Abruin as a generalization of this uh, graph construction uh, phase of the Abruin graphs mm -hmm. so do you glue k-mers still or do you glue the whole reads you can define it in a different way so this is a Sort of a framework and, uh, in, and it depends on the application. So, for instance, in, in fly, we glue sequence based on local alignments. But, um, originally in Abrun, we were proposed, we proposed to glue k-mers, but instead of gluing all k-mers, uh, as in the Brun graph, we are gluing some k-mers. And, uh, so this sort of like, we slightly changed the rules of gluing, and this is why we call it a Bruin graph because mm -hmm. it's it's sort of generalized version. So when when you say in fly you glue sequences, it means you uh, do pairwise local alignments of all the reads against all the other reads, mm -hmm. and you glue only the parts of the reads that locally align to exactly. each other. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And but all this sort of started from. Uh, we, we, we're using the ideas that were described in a Bruin paper. And basically the idea was that, okay, so we have noisy reads and most of the k-mers in the streets are erroneous. Let's even, even short k-mers, even k-mers of size 15. And for, for comparison, the, uh, short read assemblers for luminary read assemblers, they use maybe 50, uh, k equals 50. In short reads, we use k, k equals 15. And still, if you enumerate all the k-mers in your reads, most of them will be erroneous because they will likely contain, uh, contain errors. But there are some correct k-mers. So aligning all the reads against all other reads sounds very expensive, right? The alignment algorithm itself is... Uh, let's say quadratic and then you have a quadratic on top of it which is all against all and um, how do you manage to to make that fast so in in fly we introduced something we called uh disjoint ticks mm, and yes you're right um it is expensive to align all reads against themselves and this would be like a step back to to this uh error correction Techniques. In Fly, we propose, uh, we introduce disjoint ticks. Um, and we, disjoint ticks are, they are sort of similar to Contix. Uh, and the idea is that you can build these disjoint ticks really, really fast. And you will cover your entire genome with these disjoint ticks. And then you can build, uh, your graph and then you can compute alignments, pairwise alignments of these joint and build the graph. But instead of uh, working with the whole set of reads, you'll be only working with these this joint ticks, so your like search space will be reduced significantly. Hmm. So do, do you want to explain what a contig is for, for those who don't know? Right. So um, basically the contig is a part of, a, an assembled part of, of the genome. 
So contexts are typically the output of genome assembler. Um, and this is because uh, usually genome assemblers do not, cannot recover the entire whole original genome sequence. And this is because there are some ambiguities in the graph caused by uh, repetitive regions in the genome that could not be uh, sort of resolved. You cannot distinguish between long copies of, of repeats within the genome. And this is why uh, mm, you cannot reconstruct the whole genome sequence, but you can reconstruct parts of it. Uh, and these parts is what we call this uh, context. So a set of contexts covers your entire genome, but the order of this context is unknown. So you get like a set of sequences, and you know that they represent your genome, but you don't know the structure of the genome. And uh, and this is actually where long reads come into play, because with longer reads, you can resolve more uh, repeats, and thus your assembly will be more will contain less context, so it will be less fragmented. Right. So, so the fewer contigs we get, and the longer contigs we get, the better the assembly is. Yes, that's true. Um, yeah. So, and the idea of fly is, given the set of reads, we can generate this set of um, sort of draft contigs. We call them disjointigs because they are sort of less accurate than uh, uh, this context that you'll get in the end of the assembly process. So. We sort of construct this draft, uh, disjoint uh, using a greedy approach. So we simply take, uh, a random read and try to extend it left and right based on this, uh, the overlapping, based on the overlap. So we take a read and we find all overlapping reads, uh, from your, uh, from your set of reads. And then you, uh, select any of those reads and you extend and then you continue this process. So it's kind of like a greedy extension and we can do this really fast because we do not compute all pairwise alignments. We only compute alignments for reads that sort of became a uh, parcel of, of the joint ticks. So this is why we can do this really fast. But on the other hand, mm, on the other hand, um, we do not guarantee that um, the disjointics are very accurate. Mm, they might contain incorrect resolved repeats because uh, we do not attempt to, to resolve them at this stage. But the idea is that we can generate this set of disjointics really fast and then we can build uh, a Bruin or repeat graph. So we called we, in, in fly implementation, we call the graph that we uh, constructing a repeat graph, but you might think of it as a sort of a implementation of a Brewing Graph framework. And we can construct this repeat graph from disjoint X, and it sort of fixes the issues that disjoint X possibly have had. And in the end, we can sort of result into this repeat graph E really, really fast. We can generate it fast. We can, and it's free of errors in, in, in the end once it's constructed. So this is the idea how we basically speed up the graph construction process. Right. So um, so your repeat graph is sort of like an Abroin graph. And an Abroin graph is in turn sort of like the Abroin graph. So like for, for people who are familiar with the basics of genome assembly, but... Uh, are, are not keeping up with the with all the publications, so mm -hmm. you can you can imagine it as a sort of deep run graph, right? And so uh -huh. your disjointics they spell out some paths, right, on the deep run graph, not necessarily the same paths that the genome itself right. spells. Yes, basically yes. So you may think about disjointics as a random box on on the genome graph. And this could be like, it, it, it could be a repeat graph, or you may think about this as a different graph. And disjoint X essentially represents walks on these graphs. And they do not necessarily correspond to the uh, genomic path, the correct genomic path, because as I said, they might have 
containing character result repeats. Uh, but once the graph is constructed, we basically uh, have all these incorrect result repeats collapsed, and this is this is the intuition why um, the uh, this sort of fixes the errors. And um, after the graph is built, we apply the uh, conventional uh, procedures that were originally developed for debugging graphs for short tree sequencing, such as repeat resolution. So. I think as I, as I, uh, was telling you in the beginning, we align reads on the repeat graph and then we resolve repeats. This time we resolve them accurately and, um, and then we generate your final, uh, quantic sequence. Right. So, uh, you keep bringing up the repeats. So, so let's talk about repeats. Why do they cause a problem for assembly and what, what does it mean to resolve a repeat? So the problem with repeats is, ima let's imagine you had a genome with no repeats at all. So the sequence is purely unique. In this case, you should be able to assemble the genome, the entire chromosome, uh, really, really easy. Um, so because there's just one way to stitch together all just, the reads. Just one way to stitch together all the reads. Once you have repeats, it's more difficult because once you hit the repeat, you don't know which copy of this repeat is it. And it could be like in, in multiple places in the genome. And you, you need to be really careful, uh, because through, you, you may sort of jump from, from one location of the repeat to another location of repeat. And this, this will result in something that uh, we call a misassembly when you like artificial join two different regions of, of the genome. So, um, and to distinguish between repeat copies, uh, you can imagine that you need a read that is longer than, than the repeat. So this way the repeat kind of bridges, uh, the read bridges the repeat because it has unique anchors on the left and on the right side of the repeat that we can use to, to tell, uh, okay, this repeat came to like, this position from this position of the genome because we know this unique sequence is um, is suggesting to this unique sequence on the left and on the right, um, and to but to basically to resolve this repeat, and this is the idea behind the resolving repeat. You need reads that are longer than repeats, and you need unique sequence anchors. Um, and the problem is basically you need to identify repeats in your reads. And you need to um, encode them somehow to to resolve them accurately. And this is why this is actually why the assemblers use different kinds of graphs. Um, so we think it is it is critical to encode these repeats and to know where they are in the graph in the assembly to accurately resolve them. And the Bruin graphs. One of the benefits of different graphs and related graphs, such as repeat graphs that we use, is they, that they explicitly encode repeats and they give you the boundaries of these repeats. You tell, they tell you where these repeats are. How exactly do they encode repeats? Well, basically, um, you will have edges that correspond to repeat sequence. So, uh, some of the edges of your graph will, will correspond to the unique sequence, but other edges will sort of encode the repeats. And the junctions between these edges will correspond to the boundaries of, of repeats. And a, a simplest example of a repeat could be that you have one single edge that is a repetitive edge, and you have two unique sequences that enter this repeat from the left side. And then you have two unique sequences that exit this repeat on the right side. And sort of if your, um, unique, unique entrances are A and B, and then the exits are C and D, this repeat sort of allows you to transitions. It allows you to transition from A to C and from B to D, or it allows you to transition from A to D and from B to C. And this sort of creates the ambiguity because you don't know which which path corresponds to the the correct genome genome path in the graph. And we we will we are looking for this kind of structures when we 
when we try to classify each edge as, as either unique or repetitive. So to to go back to fly, so the pipeline of, of fly looks like this. So first you compute the disjoint ticks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we talked about how you do that. So you keep extending the, the mm -hmm. reads. It is very simple. Actually. We just keep extending reads until until we're done, basically, until we hit some sequence that is already assembled. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, only at that point you actually start building a graph, right? Yes. We start building the graph after we basically based on the disjointives that we have constructed. Right. So how, how does that process work? Um, so we take our disjointives and we do pairwise alignments between... All, we, we compute all possible local alignments uh, within this set of disjointives. Uh, but it is easier to do than computing pairwise alignment between uh, the entire set of reads because you have much less sequence now. So, um, disjointing sort of compactly represent your read sets as, as it's kind of like, uh, simplifies the read representation. So you like condense, you collapse all your redundancy in reads into like a single disjointing or multiple disjointings. So it's sort of like a consensus sequence. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, and we compute the, uh, local alignments and then the idea is that we sort of glue the sequence that was aligned. And this sequence, this glued part will be, most of them will be the repetitive parts. So we take this local alignments and we glue the sequence and, um, and we, we result into a repeat graph. So compare it with a Debian graph construction. In Debian graph construction, we glue all k-mers that spell the same strings. In the repeat graph, we glue the sequence that was aligned that is highly similar. So this is essentially the same idea, but um, with a different implementation because uh, it is it is difficult to apply the burn graphs to long reads directly because of the high error rate, and we compute the Local alignments allow us to tolerate this high noise of, of long reads. So that's mm -hmm. the, the idea behind repeat graphs. We, we want to use the similar framework to Debian graphs because there's a lot of methods that have been developed, uh, already and we want to reuse them. But to construct the graph, we need to be more creative because of the high, high noise rate. Right, that makes sense. So once you have a repeat graph, you can apply all the algorithms for mm -hmm. for the brown graphs. But uh, can can you walk us through those uh, subsequent steps? So, well, the most important part is uh, repeat resolution. So once you have your graph constructed, you have all repeats of that um, that are longer than some uh, some predefined threshold revealed on the graph as edges, and we typically use um, threshold, we typically collapse repeats of size longer than uh, 1000, and for for most of the data sets, this threshold is even uh, higher, so it could be 3000 or 5000. So can, can you explain what that means? What, what does it mean to collapse or not to collapse a repeat? So like in terms of construction, we Let's say we have a, uh, a threshold of length, uh, 3k. This means that we will only compute local, we only store local alignments that are longer than 3k. And all the repeats that are revealed on the graph will also be longer than 3k. And we sort of ignore the repeats that are shorter, which greatly simplifies the, the structure of the graph. And this is how the Brun graphs and short tree assembly approaches are different. So, in short tree assembly approaches, um, on Debian graph, you will get repeats that are very, very short. Uh, that could be, say, like all repeats longer than uh, 50 uh, base pairs will be uh, on the graph. And this complicates the graph structure a lot because you have more 
in genomes you have this is sort of an exponential distribution of free length so you have a lot of shorter repeats and once you increase your uh, threshold you'll get less and less repeats and like on bacterial genomes there are only a few actually only a few repeats let's say on the E. coli genome so bacteria that different different bacterial genomes are very different but let's say for E. coli genome there are only maybe seven repeats that are longer than 5,000 base pairs and no repeats that are longer than 7,000. Uh, and because we have uh, long reads, we can basically increase this this uh, repeat length threshold because we kind of bypass the shorter repeats. They are like sort of stay inside the reads and we do not we do not care about them because we like sort of uh, we compute the alignments that are longer than repeat length. So we're we're kind of safe. Nice, nice. And right, so you were telling how the repeat resolution works, I think? Yes. Um, so repeat resolution, mm, basically we have our graph with repeats collapsed. In, well, by, by collapsing, I mean that original repeats in the genome, they are collapsed into a single edge on on the graph. And then we take our original reads and align and I align the streets to the graph. And now let's think about this, uh, this simple repeat example that I was telling you about. So there are two entrances, A and B, and two exits of, uh, C and D. And if you see that all reads consistently take one of the paths, but not the other. So let's say most of the reads align to, uh, traverse A, then they enter the repeat and then they exit at C. And like the second half of the reads enter B and then traverse the repeat and exits and at D. Then we know actually this tells us what, um, how the genome traverses this graph. And if we consistently see this support by, by reads, we can simplify the graph by, uh, sort of separating this, uh, two repeat copies into two separate, uh, paths. And this is, this is what we, we call, uh, repeat resolution. So if we see, uh, an evidence from reads that genome takes one path, but not the other, we can, we can separate this part of, of the genome path. And this way we simplify the graph. Okay. So now you have a simplified repeat graph, which has, uh, I guess more edges, but fewer junctions. Yes, exactly. And, and what, what do you do next? And so next is basically, as you said, um, uh, it has slightly more edges, but yes, the, it's less tangled. It has less, uh, repeat junctions because some repeats are resolved. And all, and as a result, you will have like a long unbranching, non-branching paths on this graph as a result of repeat resolution. And this non-branching paths will correspond to to the reconstructed uh, genome sequence, and this will be your context, basically. So after repeats are resolved, we generate context as non-branching paths on the on the final simplified graph. And this this will be the output of the, the assembly uh, of the genome assembly. So some some of those contexts will be uh, simple context, but some will be unresolved repeats, right? Um, that's, that's right. So, yes, in reality, it's a little, little more complex because, um, let's say, uh, let's think about this, uh, repeat example again. So let's assume that this time you could not resolve a repeat. You could not, uh, because it was it was longer than the, uh, the quantic length. Oh, okay. Uh, because, um, the repeat length was longer than, uh, the read length. You were not able to resolve this repeat. Mm, but then, um, you have your A and B entrances, and you know that A, that repeats always, so you know that, uh, the path, the genome path goes from A inside the repeat. 
but you don't know how it exits. But um, you, well, you still know that the repeat, like the A, unique part A ends with a repeat. So when you're generating context, you basically can extend the unique edge A with the repetitive sequence. So it, it increases the length of your context a little bit, and it also simplifies the representation. So most of the context will be uh, representing the, the unique uh, parts of the genome. Um, so, and we also try not to sort of over... So in this example, we will extend context A and B to the right into, inside the repeat, but we will not do this with, uh, we will not extend the exits C and D to the left inside the repeat because it will kind of like create artificial duplicated sequence. So we want to avoid that. Um, but yeah, so this is the idea of, of context generation. We take the non-branching paths, we take the unique non-branching paths, and try to extend it into the repetitive parts in the graph if there's no ambiguity in terms of how how the uh, um, genomic path goes until we sort of hit the uh, ambiguous junction, then we stop. So this process gives you a set of contexts, which are um, separate sequences, mm -hmm. right? But when we download a... Uh, a genome build, let's say, of Drosophila or of human uh, in in the FASTA format, then we have a single sequence per chromosome, right? It's not a set of contexts per chromosome, mm -hmm. which is a s single sequence. So how do you uh, put those contexts together in a single sequence? Okay. Um, so this is, yes, so you're right that uh, for... Let's say with long reads for um, bacterial genomes, you you will most likely get your uh, entire chromosomes assembled, and maybe for simple eukaryotic genomes as well. But you're right that for still for more complex genomes such as Drosophila or human, you will not get the whole chromosomes. You you'll get a few contexts per chromosome. And then you need to uh, somehow assign your context to chromosome and and assemble. And this is what people call uh, genome finishing. This is a whole different process, and there are many different techniques. So, and they also evolving and changing constantly. So, in this, um, there are a few things you can do. You can try to use complementary technologies to basically what we call scaffold your context uh, into more uh, contiguous sequences. Um, let's say, mm, and there might be different um, different ways to get this evidence of the order. So you basically want to order your context. Mm -hmm. And for instance, um, there is, uh, well, one simplest, one simple way could be if you have a, some sort of genome map. It could be a genetic map, um, um, or like restriction map. So you sort of have an idea how the chromosome structure looks like, and you know uh, how you know the approximate location of the genes on your chromosome from some maybe from some genetic studies, and then you can locate these genes on the on your context. And if you have two contexts and you know that's like two genes on this context follow each other, they are close on the chromosome, you can sort of, uh, put, stitch these two contexts together. So, and there are many biotechnologies that allow you to do this, not based on genes, but based on different information such as, um, BioNano. BioNano is, um, Basically, a technology that allows you to get a chromosome maps based on, uh, I think restriction. This is sort of restriction maps. So, um, you can, you can put the, like a long chromosome fragment in, in a machine and it will, uh, cut it at, at the particular locations 
uh, which uh, are recognized by some enzymes. So if you have like a particular nucleotide pattern at, at, at some location, it will like enzyme will cut it. And then you can uh, image, uh, you can like visualize this restriction map. Um, and you can basically do this computational for your reconstructed context as well. And then you can compare these two restriction maps and this will, uh, might tell you how to order your context so they are um, sort of consistent with the restriction maps that you're getting. And there is, there are, uh, other technologies such as high C. So high C, with high C, you get, uh, pairs of reads, um, that, um, that come from related regions of, of chromosomes. And if you have these pairs of reads that consistently allows align to like a pair of, of contigs, then you can, uh, say that, okay, these contigs, uh, they, uh, must be, uh, connected together in, in the genome. And, and you can use the complementary sequencing technologies as well. Uh, but usually genome finishing is, is like a very long and time consuming process. And at this stage, you also need to make sure that you need to do a lot of quality controls. So, um, but I think with long reads, this process, uh, becomes simpler because you have, uh, you have longer assemblies in the beginning. And mm, also there are more, uh, biotechnologies that, that like can help. So this, this field is improving, uh, rapidly, um, like genome finishing. And we, in the past few years, we started to get like more and more complete or almost complete, um, genomes. But there cool. are still challenges. Yes. If you think about this human, human reference genome is technically not complete yet. Mm -hmm. Yes. You, you get, uh, entire chromosomes, but there are gaps in, in the chromosomes. So there are like parts filled with ends. If you, if you look in the faster sequence, you see like a long, long stretch of ends, like megabytes of ends. Um, and this means that we don't know the sequence inside this region. We know the order. We know that there's something in there and we know the order of the adjacent sequence, but we don't know what's inside. And, um, and this is why we actually need long reads. We, we, I believe we can use long reads to fill these, uh, gaps. Um, in, and there are actually ongoing efforts to finally finish the human genome using the, uh, ultra long, uh, Oxford nanopore reads that basically allow you to span these gaps in, in full or almost like entirely. Yeah. Uh, didn't they, uh, finish the X, the human X chromosome recently? Yes. They, they recently announced that they, uh, Assembled the X chromosome in full. And the, the most difficult part was to assemble the centromere region because I believe it's roughly three megabytes long. And, um, it's, uh, it is not yet possible to produce reads that like are this long. So you might get reads maybe over hundred thousands and maybe a couple of hundred, uh, routinely. And then you need to some, you need some creativity to basically stitch these reads together and span this centromere. And the challenge is that centromere is basically a, a tandem repeat that is repeated many, many times. So you, you may think about this, this like a, uh, 200 base pair sequence that is repeated millions, uh, all hundreds of thousands times in the centromere. So, and, you still somehow need to, to assemble through it. So this is like, I think a very interesting and uh, interesting challenge that people will focus in, in yeah, the future. Definitely. So one way to judge the quality of, of an assembly is uh, the, the classic metric, which is called NG50, but you also propose a modified version of that metric called NGA50. So can you talk about these two metrics and what is the difference between them? Okay. So, well, NGA50, I think was originally introduced in, um, I, I believe in one of the, uh, assemble tone studies or maybe gauge. So they were like, uh, early 
studies that were evaluating the the quality of different uh, of many different short field assemblers. So and they were like introducing different metrics, and then it was implemented in the Quast uh, quality assessment tool for for long uh, for for genome assemblers. And now the, it is one of the uh, default and I believe one of the most important metrics uh, for quality assessment. So basically, let's start from N50. So original N50 was was uh, the quality uh, metric for for genome assembly. And as as we were talking about, the longer your conducts are, the less fragmented they are, the better assembly is. But um, the number of contexts uh, sometimes might be misleading if you simply count the number of contexts because you might have, it doesn't take into account the length distribution. So you might have um, a few really, really long contexts, but maybe thousands of short contexts that could be artifacts of the assembly process. Uh, and this will inflate your, your contact counts. So N50 was introduced such as a sort of like a weighted measure or that takes into account the length distribution. And it is defined as, uh, so N50 is a, um, so let's say you have all your contacts sorted from the longest to the shortest. And you start um, uh, taking, and you're going from the left to the right, and you're taking your, uh, the longest contacts until the set of contexts, your set of contexts cover the half of the entire assembly size. And the length of this context that you took last will be your N50. So essentially the contexts that are longer than N50 covered half of your uh, total assembly size. And um, this is a very, like this, this is one, I, I believe the most popular metric for, for genome. Uh, assembly comparison and um ng50 is is very similar but instead of um covering the assembly size uh you need to cover the uh genome size and this is because um the assembly size might be shorter than uh your target genome size um because of the collapse repeats, because of some missing sequence, uh, there, there could be different reasons. And, and G50 also allows you to compare multiple assemblies because multiple, uh, assemblies might have different size as well. And, and G50 sort of like, uh, is a common denominator for, for, uh, multiple assemblies comparison. Okay. So now NGA50. So there's like a letter A. Extra letter A, and it stands for alignment. Um, so the problem with NG50 is that uh, it doesn't take, it doesn't evaluate the correctness of the assembly. Uh, and you might think about this as a, let's say you have your assembly. How can you improve it? How can you improve N50? Well, you can do, you can simply concatenate all your contexts together and this, and you get like a perfect N50 or an NG50, but Will be a correct assembly now. Uh, so what NGA50 does or NA50 is you, um, you align your context. If you have a reference genome, so this is a reference based metric and a reference genome is basically your, uh, gold standard for your assembly. And this is something that you can compare it to and you can evaluate your algorithms. Um, and typically, um, you don't have reference genomes for like completely novel organisms, but you you have reference genomes for for organisms that already have been sequenced, or you might have. So um, okay, and JF50 is a reference based metric, and what you do you align your context to the reference genome, and then if you see any breakpoints, if you see that a context is um, kind of like a one part of the context aligns to one. Our region of the genome and the other part aligns somewhere like to a completely different part of the genome. Then you can split this, uh, then you split this quantic into two parts. And NGA50 is basically NG50 computed on this, uh, 
contexts that are broken at the at these uh, inconsistent positions. So you try to undo the cheating. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Okay, and uh, so you compared your uh, tool with the other assemblers, and in, mm-hmm. in terms of NG50 and NG50, and uh, what did you find? So we found that uh, that fly typically uh, on 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 many genomes it consistently um, performs at equally well, and sometimes even and sometimes better on on some uh on various genomes that we like were benchmarking such as east genomes or c elegans genome um and we significantly improved on uh canoe and mazurka assemblers uh on on the human genome assembly um and and this is measured uh with this nga and ng50 metrics as well as the number of we also evaluate the number of uh, errors based on the structure comparison that I described. And uh, on the human genome, we were also significantly faster. We were, I believe, roughly tenfold faster than uh, than canoe and Mazurka. And Mazurka is a hybrid assembler, actually. Um, and we we see the similar trend for, for other genomes that we compare as well. So we uh, typically as good as the other assemblers and sometimes to improve. Um, and we also consistently faster. And mm, right now we also work on, uh, on sort of ext- expanding, uh, fly to metagenome assembly. And this, um, presents, uh, like an additional challenges such as, uh, when you're assembling like a, a multiple, so you're essentially assembling multiple genomes, uh, simultaneously instead of just one genome. So you can imagine that the problem is, is, uh, is much more difficult. Very cool. Mikhail, uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you and, uh, I really like your work. There are both nice theoretical ideas around, uh, around this disjointics and how to build the assembly graph mm-hmm. and, and also very impressive practical results in terms of the the runtime of the program and 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 its performance so uh yeah pretty pretty cool tool and uh thank you i'll uh, I'll, I'll look for a, an opportunity to to try it out yeah for sure uh thank you roman thanks thanks for having me it it was really interesting to talk to you and sharing our more most recent results and i think it's it's a great way to to communicate to other people who who are interested in bioinformatics. So yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me.